Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Disciples Bible Study here for Sunday, July 15th. We're uh, thrilled that everybody is here with us this morning, and as is our custom, let's lay down a foundation of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, Lord. We thank you for your incredible blessings. Um, each and every day, everywhere we look, we see evidence of your love for us in the beautiful earth that you've created with the, the change of seasons here in uh, the eastern coast of uh, the United States. We thank you, Father, for uh, putting us into the families that you put us into, into the church families. Um, you have just blessed us beyond all means that we could ever ask for. Father, you are indeed a glorious and loving God. As we come together this morning, we just ask that you would clear our minds from the thoughts and anxieties and, and questions that preoccupy us, Father, that we might be able to concentrate on you and uh, fully understand, Father, through the agency of your Holy Spirit, what you have here for us this morning. These things we pray in the blessed name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. So we are about to embark on a continuation of our study here in Psalms. Um, we're going to be studying Psalms 26 and 27 this morning. And I want us to begin now in Psalm 26. It's a short psalm, but it doesn't mean that it's one that is something that we can quickly read over. Um, I've entitled this A Well-Balanced Life, and about this particular psalm, it's a devotional psalm. Um, it's a Davidic psalm as well as we see, uh, but it's a devotional psalm, one of those psalms that oftentimes we find ourselves looking at and just marveling at what is here in this particular psalm. There's an awful lot that's here in this psalm this morning. So as we begin to read, it's a Psalm of David. It says, judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I've trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. So the first thing we want to look at is this word judge. It means to examine and vindicate. In, in, in its context, David is saying, Lord, Give me justice, what I deserve, and defend my reputation. Now, that's a dangerous thing to ask God for justice. Most of the time, you and I want mercy, right? We, we want what, not getting what we deserve, and we want grace, just getting something we don't deserve. Uh, but here, David does something interesting because he is directly in with the very first word, judge me, O Lord, uh, starting off a, a request to God. Almighty, and asking for that judgment. Um, and this is a pretty intense, intense comment. So it immediately brings up the question, so why is David able to, to, to pray this prayer? And, and how is he confident that God is going to hear him? And then what's he asking God for? And you know, how do we apply the same principle in our lives? There's a lot of questions there that we have when we look at this. It's not just as simple as reading it through and saying, that's nice, and moving to the next verse. So David is characterized through scripture as a man of integrity. There's a number of references there for you to look up um, on your own, but he is in, he's characterized. Doesn't mean that he is a sin-free man. He's a man of integrity. And so there's a big difference. Every time he sinned, as he understood it, as he came to recognize his sin and he was sensitive to this, he confessed his sin, he repented of it, and he sought God's forgiveness. And this pattern repeated in his life, so he could pray this, for I've walked in my integrity. Because that's a, that's a major thing to, to, to pray. Um, in verse 1, he says that because he trusts God, he says, therefore, I shall not slide or go backwards. You see, one of the challenges that we have is is um, believers, especially as many of us have been believers for a while, sometimes it seems like one step forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. But there's a should be a overall evidentiary pattern of general growth over time. And so it's not that every step he makes is right, 
every step he makes is pure, but he's he has integrity about it. And integrity here is him seeing him as God sees him. Very important for us to have that perspective. Integrity is always seeing ourselves as God sees us. God sees us as a sinner in need of salvation. So we really need to keep that perspective. He he says here that he's going to walk in integrity for one reason. His faith is not in himself. It's in God. His faith, it says, I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore, because of that, I'm not going to slide. I'm not going to slide back. I'm not going to return to the old way of doing things. You know, for most of us who came to faith, there was a prior time in our lives that we may remember what we were like before we came to faith. Cheryl and I were having that conversation before we began this morning. Most of us have baggage that we look at. We say, how could the Lord possibly love me who's done this, 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 and this? The fact is, God knew you the whole way. God knew you before the foundations of the of, of the world. Um, as, as some theologians have quipped, uh, I'm glad he knew me then because if he knew me now, he might not want me. Uh, but the fact is, he does. He knows you now. He knew you back before the foundation of the, the earth. And so David can say he's going to walk in his integrity because his faith is in God and not himself. You see, this is the same basis upon which you and I are continually sanctified. Remember the three stages of salvation. Justification happened once when we confessed our, Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We then entered into the sanctification stage, which is a continual process of becoming less like the person we were and more like the image of Jesus Christ. And it's a slow and not just just smooth, it's it's jerky, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, but with a general progress. And so we're being continually sanctified because we're walking by faith. The more we trust God and do what he says, regardless of what we see, it's trusting God in that step. As we begin to trust God, God then fills back into us the strength that allows us to walk in integrity. This is really a key point for us to look at. God gives us, always will give us the strength to walk in integrity as we walk. And so as we put our next foot down, we are, we are showing faith. I mean, you get to a certain point when you take a step forward that you can't pull yourself back. You're committed to that step. That process of continually taking those steps according to faith and not by sight, God will give us the strength. And so we can only do this if, like David, we continually humble ourselves, we confess our sins, we repent of them, we seek God's face, we seek his forgiveness, because he's promised us that. In 1 John 1, 9, the Christian's bar of soap is a just, it's a life verse for many of us to remember and understand and apply liberally every single day of our lives, because every day is not, you know, while justification is a once done for all time, sanctification is a continuous, continual, moment by moment process of trusting God. The more we trust him, the more he gives us strength so that we have that integrity and we see ourselves as he sees us. So it says in verse three, for thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I've not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. Here David recounts the intentional behavior that evidence his desire to live a godly life. It's one thing to say, I want to live a godly life. It's another thing to have behavior. And so remember, he opened this up and said, judge me, O Lord. So he's not going to be sitting there lying to God and saying, well, I did this and I did that. No, he's, he's speaking from the heart. And so he, he avoided certain kinds of people. And it didn't mean that he didn't come in contact with them. He just didn't hang out with them. He just didn't fellowship with them. And so here are the four kinds of people that are specified here. I see this as a synecdoche which means we have four examples, but there's a lot more, but the four examples serve as a pretty good definition of these kinds of folks. So he avoided these four kinds of people. The first one were vain persons, shav, morally desolate, 
Figuratively, they're idol worshipers. They've placed something in their lives ahead of God. God wants to be number one on a list of one. These are folks that say, well, you know, I've got my career, I've got my family, I've got my health, I've got my quiet time, I have, you know, whatever it is that they're into. Um, and, and they can, you know, they can say that they place God first, but you'll see how they spend their time and what they do. Um, and, and, you know, our actions do accuse us. So vain people, morally desolate people that put something in place of God. That's the first group. Second group is dissemblers. Didn't know what this word meant until I looked it up. The word alam, which means to conceal or disguise. This is the hypocrite. This is the person that appears to be all sorts of godly and all sorts of, you know, the butter just wouldn't melt in their mouth. And yet they're evil at heart and they're trying to really cover up who they are. They're truly hypocrites. Third group is evildoers, ra'ah, to make or be good for nothing. These are people who gather to indulge evil behaviors, evil vices. They're the ones that enjoy doing things that they shouldn't do. And so they get together with buddies who will also support them and encourage them in that process. And that's the people that he says, I don't want to have anything to do with these people. I don't want to, I don't want to deal with people that, that has somebody other that God is number one on their list. I don't want to be with hypocrites. I don't want to be with people that are intentionally gathering to do evil. And I don't want to be with the wicked people, the actively ungodly people, these, these people that are regular practitioners of wickedness. Now, you cannot, I repeat, you cannot walk outside your door. In fact, you can't walk with inside your house sometimes to see people that do practice these things. You and I are known by the company we keep. This, this is a talking about not just coming in contact with. Look. We're ambassadors here on this planet. We're placed here for the purpose of living in this area and in our careers and in our families, but we're known by the company we keep, the people we hang out with, because the choices we make in this life will matter in eternity. It doesn't mean that we avoid these folks, but we don't fellowship with them. So by necessity, we're going to come in contact with them. They could be customers of what we, you know, of, of the companies we work for. They could be people that we work for. They could be people that we work with. They could be the people to the right, to the left of us, across the street. We're going to be, we're going to be in the world, but we're not of the world. We don't hang with these people. Now, if you look at this, for thy loving kindness is before mine eyes. I've walked in thy truth. I've not sat with vain people. Neither will I go in with dissemblers. I've hated the congregation of evildoers, not sit with the wicked. Does this sound familiar? These words, do they sound at all familiar? They probably should. I've walked in thy truth. I've not sat with vain people. I won't go in with dissemblers. I won't sit with the wicked. You see, this should bring us to Psalm 1.1. And two, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he does meditate day and night. It, this is such an echo to Psalm 1. And so many people will say, well, for that reason, David's the writer of Psalm 1, even though it doesn't say it is. he is, because there's the, almost the same language there. Um, again, I think it's a very interesting thing. Continuing on in verse 6, I will wash my hands in innocency, so I will compass thine altar, O Lord, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell all of thy wondrous works. Man, oh man, if there's any verse that you and I need to really spend some time understanding is, the, is verse 7, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving, being thankful and saying it to everyone how thankful we are. Verse 8, Lord, I've loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whom hands are mischief and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I'll walk in mine integrity. Redeem me and be merciful to me. My foot standeth in an even place in the congregation. I will bless the Lord. And so here, David, in verses 6 to 8, is stating intentional choices of where and how he's going to spend his time and his efforts. These are, these are intentional choices. 
you and I make intentional choices every minute of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year, of every year that we have of life on this planet. We're all about making intentional choices. And so David is stating where his are. Now, in verses 9 and 10, he prays for God's grace and mercy to protect him from bad company. It's one thing to say, I don't want to associate with these people, but it's another thing to ask God's protection against being corrupted by these people and being protected from these people. Because guess what? If you're for God, many on this planet are your enemy. You only need to turn the TV on and look at some of the tomfoolery that's going on here in our country and see that there are a lot of people maybe a very small minority, but a very vocal and violent minority that is bad company. And so we need to be praying God's protection. Third thing that we should take away from this passage, and I love this statement, but as for me, but as for me, he's making a personal commitment. He says, as for me, I'll walk in my integrity. This is what my will is in my life, to walk in my integrity, to see me as you see me, Lord. And then He's able to pray for God's redemption and mercy. You see, David's feet are always on level ground in order for him not to stumble, of course, because he believes God for his future. He doesn't believe the crazy stuff and crazy talk that we see on broadcast TV and we read about in the newspaper, we hear on the radio. Most of the things that we hear are the agents and voices of this world trying everything they can do to frighten people, to stampede them, to simply forsake their God and trust something else. Trusting other voices gets us in trouble. So let's talk about the application of this, and it's pretty interesting. We are to live a well-balanced life. And so how do we do that, given the circumstances that you and I face in 2020? Well, for the first part, I'm going to let this diagram represent, this looks like a a pizza pie. I'm going to represent the life, as you will. The first choice that we have to make is what's at the center. God has to be at the center of everything that we do. If you want a well-balanced life, you have to put God there in the center. He's got to be involved with and aware of everything. Well, he is aware of everything, but he has to be involved with because we've invited him into the process. And so we arrange our life. And so here are six examples of of different things that are parts of our life. And these things that are parts of our life, God needs to be involved in everything. Guess what? I didn't put um, fingernail clipping in there, but he needs to be involved in that too. He needs to be involved in washing dishes and making beds. He needs to be involved in everything that we do because he's interested in everything that we do. You see, These aren't identical divisions, although they look like for the purposes of making a a diagram, but they're going to change over one's life. Everything needs to be in balance with another. When you get out of balance, you get problems. And so everything needs to be in its own proper balance to the whole. But everything, first of all, starts with God at the center. Now, the balance is going to change because, you know, Early in our life, when we were children, the balance was different. But when we became married and and had children, it it changed. And then as as we, you know, they the kids moved out, it changed again. And so as we as our circumstances change, and wherever life is 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 in that for you, there needs to be a balance that you have of the things with God at the center. See. David was intentional about keeping things in healthy balance. This is one of the reasons why he could pray this this psalm and why he could say what he did, because everything's in balance. We need to be keeping things in healthy balance because it starts first with God at the center of everything. That's usually where we get out of balance. See, if we allow our time to be spent out of balance, what happens is the wheel becomes flat. And then the ride that the wheel is on is very, very bumpy and not pleasurable for anything. When we're out of balance, things don't seem right. And so we need to recognize that being in balance is that wheel, and that wheel needs to be circular so it will be able to move forward as as we go. Out of balance lives always are bumpy. Having a godly, well-lived life 
is, is, is a matter of making the right choices with God always at the center. Once God's at the center and you always place him at the center, then you arrange your activities around this in the correct balance. This is where David is driving at for living a life in balance. And so it's an important message for us this morning. But it also sets up the next Psalm, Psalm 27, which means if you have it in balance, then one of the things you need to do is to live your life without fear. The fact is that most people live their lives with lots of fear, and as we'll see in just a minute. So first of all, from a housekeeping perspective, this is possibly dispensationally Daniel's 70th week. I'll, I'll show you some reasons why I believe that it's a foreshadowing of Daniel's 70th week. It's also another one of those devotional psalms. And see, here, here is sort of a structure of the way this might fit. There's three specific fears that are spelled out, circumstances, failure, and the future. Well, it's interesting when you, when you look at this psalm, this psalm was one likely written very early in David's life, probably prior to his anointing uh, by Samuel to be king probably prior to 1029 BC. And so when you look at the different, the, remember his life is going to be based on and his fears are going to be based on what he's learned so far in life, circumstances, failure in the future. And it's interesting that, you know, what, what are people afraid of today? I did a little bit of research, a, a place called the statistical brain. If you Google that and, um, and type in uh, fear, you'll, you'll see some things that are interesting. According to their research, 60% of the things that are feared never take place. 30% of the things that were feared happened in the past, and guess what? They can't be changed. 90% of the things that people fear on retrospect are insignificant issues. 88% of things that people fear in relationship to health won't happen. You see, the top phobias in the United States. Fear of public speaking is the number one. 74% of people are afraid of public speaking. Fear of death, 68%. Fear of spiders, 30%. Fear of darkness, 11 Of heights, 10 Of social situations, sociophobia, um, 8%. Fear of flying, 6.5%. Fear of confined spaces, 2.5%. Fear of open spaces, 2 and a quarter. Fear of thunder and lightning, 2%. So people are fearful. And of, of the people in the United States, 6.3 million people openly confess having a phobia or have been diagnosed with a phobia. People are afraid. And people are more afraid than what they admit, especially when we get into crazy times like what you and I are living in right now. And so we turn to Scripture. In Psalm 27, a Psalm of David begins, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So fear. What do we have? What is it? Why does mankind fear has so much to fear? Well, first of all, some have described fear as the opposite of love and the opposite of trust. The best definition I heard ever was fear is sand in the machinery of life. It just makes things not go. And when they do go, they're not pleasant. Fear in the machinery of life. Well, fear is an opposite of love. Fear is an opposite of trust. But it's a progressive emotion rooted in believing what is untrue to be true. It's wrong belief. It starts out with believing something that is wrong. And this is really where that we need to really pay attention to this because it's what gets us into trouble because wrong belief just doesn't sit there. It's not inert. What we believe affects what we think and how we do things. And so this is a progressive emotion, this fear, but it's rooted in wrong belief. Key point, rooted in wrong belief. But it induces doubt, and then doubt gives place to worry or anxiety. So we begin to doubt something, and then we begin to worry about it. You see the pathology start here? Well, when we worry about it long enough, we then give, it, it produces fear, and fear can bring on episodes of terror. We don't know why we're terrified of something. We're terrified to go out because we might catch this disease or that disease. We're terrified to go out because we might get hit by a car. 
It's unreasonable fear. And where, where do we start? We start with wrong belief. It starts with wrong belief. You see, get this point. You can't find in Scripture any place where God says in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and the first half of 3, don't be afraid, fear not. But we find it everywhere afterwards. Fear came. The first thing they did after they sinned, they feared God. They hid. Fear is a part of sin nature. That's where it comes from. It's We lost a whole lot more than we think we lost through the agency of Adam following Eve into sin. Fear, fear, fear is part of sin nature. And as long as we are willing to yield our lives to sin nature, we are going to be full of fear. That is a fact. Conversely, trust and love are part of God's nature. They're available to his children immediately upon justification. Whether or not they're appropriated as part of justification is really part of what sanctification is all about. Sanctification is to get out, to to remove, and be no longer controlled by the power of of sin in our life. But another part of that is to be no longer fear-controlled. Because we now have the basis for correct belief. We no longer need to live prisoners of our fear. Anyone who is a Christian who lives in fear does so by voluntarily placing themselves under the chains of fear. In other words, fear for a believer is an elected state by the believer. It is a choice. We either trust God or we don't. And that's the issue, and that for most of us as we mature as Christians is the central issue in our life. Do we trust him? So, David said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Well, based on what you understand about fear, why is his opening line so important for us to digest? Remember, we're to chew this for a while. Where to chew the cud. And man, oh man, oh man, if there was ever a place there there could be a Selah, this would be it. We really need to chew on this one. Well, first of all, his progression of fear is terminated at its root because he says, the Lord is my light. Not the world, not other people. The Lord is my light. And my salvation, who shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? In other words, he's replaced wrong belief with right belief, and he has no fear. And fear is the outcome of wrong belief. The right belief is the Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. He's the strength of my life. Three facts for David. And man, if there's anything we should appropriate for ourselves this morning— It's looking at these three facts and saying, if you were a Christian, you got all three of them. See, God who created light is his source of illumination. He knows that David is in a planet full of sin. David knows that. He needs God's light. He doesn't need his own light. Remember, in Psalm 26, he was trusting God, not himself. Here, he's got to trust God for his source of illumination, because he's got to walk through life. We're told in Psalm 119, 105, the the word, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your word, God's word was put here so that we could be illuminating our, our, our path and that we need not stumble because we're walking circumspectly to see the things that we could stumble over. And that light should be illuminating us. God makes it clear what we can't see on our own because of the darkness of the world, because there's nothing more that Satan wants to do to a Christian is to have a Christian stumble and become fearful. Because when a Christian stumbles and becomes fearful, it suggests to anybody that sees the Christian who stumbles and becomes fearful, man, if I'm like that, I'm like I'm just like the rest of the world, so I don't need this religion stuff. I don't need this God stuff. I should just go out and have a good time because tomorrow we die. You see, 
we are the living testimony of this. God placed us here to be a testimony. David was a testimony. Look at what he says in his word. Second point, David trusts God, the only one who can forgive sin for his personal salvation. It's not only the Lord, Lord is my light, but he's also my salvation. Salvation comes in nothing other than through God, not through self, not through systems, not through attending a church, not through reading something. It comes from God and God alone, because God alone is the only one who can forgive sin. I think it was Plato who said, or Socrates who said, it may be that God can forgive sin, but I don't know how. And even, even those who are rank unbelievers have a sense of this. David trusts God. And it says here in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, for God has not appointed us to wrath. He's not appointed us for wrath. Wrath comes from being judged. But in, cont in contrary to that, to obtain salvation by the only one that we can obtain salvation from, the Lord Jesus Christ. God provides what we could never provide on our own, which is to be forgiven of sin in this dark world. So we have a source of light and we have forgiveness of sin. And so David can rightly say, who shall I fear? It's taken care of. I have no fear. This is the reality that we need to live up to, not live down to the poverty of wrong belief. We need to live up to the truth of God's word. See, David says he's not able to do it on his own. And he says this in the second half of the verse. He says it because he says, the Lord is the strength of my life. He's the only one that can help me fulfill what I would like to do, which is what he has designed for me to do. You see, we live in a dark world. You've, you've seen it happen over the course of this past year, perhaps in ways that have never been so dramatically illustrated with the rank evil that is out there in this dark world. And we may be coming closer to the end of times. Just it, it's, it seems to be going nuts. We need to be trusting God and stop getting weirded out and stop getting frightened by the things we see out there. And, oh, I'm going to die of this disease. And, oh, I'm going to... You know what? God knows that your last day on this planet, and it's by his mercy that he hasn't told you what it is. Otherwise, truth be told, if we knew that, we'd be nervous wrecks. Instead, he tells us to trust him, and we need to walk through life in light of his truth, his salvation, him being our strength. Once we grasp these three, three truths, then David asked these rhetorical questions. Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? And you know, the answer is pretty simple. It's no, nobody, nobody, nothing, not a nothing, 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 nothing in, her, in heaven and earth, in the earth, on the earth, under it. Doesn't matter. Nothing, 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 nothing. We should be afraid of nothing. That's what God designed for you and me to live our lives, not to be in fear. Check these out. These truths are incredible. 1 John 4, 18 says, There's no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fears, because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made complete or perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Truth. Truth. Perfect love casts out fear. Second truth. Ephesians 6, 17 says, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. What? How does that connect? Well, it connects very much because Psalm 27, 1 talked about, you're my light. God's word is a lamp unto my feet. You're my salvation. It's right here. It's just stated differently. The same truths in the Old Testament are true to us today in the New Testament. And then the daddy Mac of all of them. Romans 8, 31 to 39. I don't know whether you've marked your Bible. I check it sometimes to make sure it's, this passage is still there, but it's an incredible one. What then shall we say to all these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? 
he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. Who's he that condemns? It's Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who's even at the right hand of God who makes intercession for us. Look, you've got the one that bought you the salvation there at God's right hand making intercession for you. You got it wired with the judge. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it's written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. No! In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, or powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen, amen, and amen. Folks, you can't get better than that. We really need to live as if this is true, because this issue of fear is fears around us, but this is true. Nothing can separate you from God's love. Nothing, nothing, nothing. What do we have to fear? Nothing. If there's anything we take away this morning from this passage, we need to really, really give this some serious thought. And we need to return to it often because we, like sheep, are easily frightened. We, like sheep, see things and we get frightened. And we go to the doctor and the doctor says, I have bad news. And our hearts drop because we fear. God knows. He says you got nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. You see, Billy Graham, the late great Billy Graham, one of the things that I love most that he said, God plus you will always, always, always make a majority. You realize that? God plus you. The rest of the world could be against you, but God plus you makes a majority. And so David writes in verse 2, when the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. You see, David's, David's declarations were reflected in his life, and they should be in your life. First of all, in David's life, this term uh, in verse two came upon me to eat up my flesh. It's a figure of speech, which is is characterizing David's enemies like a pack of starving wolves attacking their prey in order to eat it and kill it. You know, we watch the nature shows and we see examples of this stuff. And yes, this does happen. And that is what it felt like to David as his his enemies and foes, many of them. You know, David says, well, look, I'm one guy. I got all these people against me. But he didn't fear. And he says, even though this happens, they stumbled and fell. They're the ones that died in the process, not me. You see, the biblical record of, of David's life provides us a lot of examples of this. First of all, as a shepherd boy, how about the wolves and lions that he, that, that he dealt with attacking the flock? And then how about this little kid coming up against Goliath? And the whole Philistine army, his confidence was in the fact that as he's running down the hill, crossing the brook and going up on the other side of where Goliath and the armies were standing, he scooped up five stones, not because he was afraid he was going to lose. He was going to go after Goliath and his four brothers. Confidence? Absolutely. No fear. How about the 10 years that he was on the run from Saul? He was confident that God would keep his promise to make him king one day. Even though enemy nations attacked him, God always trusted God would make him victorious, and he did. His record as a military general is unblemished. He was the one that God used. God gave him the victory. And so no wonder, look at these words, when the wicked, even my enemies, my foes came up against me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. A host could come up against me. My heart shall not fear. War could come up against. I'm going to be confident. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I see. 
That's David. How about you? What, God, what did God protect you from in your childhood? He's brought you here. Have you ever stopped down and thought about the times when you could have died during childhood? Of things, of accidents that he kept you away from? Or illnesses that he kept you away from? He brought you here. How, about, how has he provided safety and opportunity during your, your adulthood? Have you stopped and thought about that and chronicled that? Heck, how did he keep you safe last night when you slept? You see, you and I, in giving this thankfulness and thanksgiving in the congregation of what he's done, we should be acknowledging the things that he's protected us from. And we would have a long, long list, wouldn't we? Verse 4, one thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek after that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and behold the beauty of the Lord to inquire in his temple. For in the times of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall all mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore, I will offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. Yea, I will sing, I will sing praises to the Lord. Well, look at his request in verse 4. Again, the psalm probably written early in his life. And then what does this have to do with fear? Well, first of all, God knew, or David knew, that God intended for him to be king after Saul. And remember, it was shortly after when Saul began to persecute him and threw a spear at him twice. And by the way, Saul was the biggest and baddest of the members of the army. That's why they elected the big guy king. And, you know, he didn't miss with his spear, but he did twice, at least. David must have wondered why his father-in-law, because Saul, because of what David did with Goliath, Saul let him marry his daughter, essentially adopting David into his family. Even though he had a son, David became a second son. He must have wondered why his father-in-law was trying to kill him. Obviously, but he didn't fear. There's a big difference. You see, he didn't fear because the thing that he most wanted to do was to dwell in eternity in God's house. You know, we dwell with people. That means we live with them. I dwell all the days of my life. He wasn't saying, hey, I want to go to the house of the Lord. Remember, the house of the Lord at the time David wrote this was a tabernacle, a tent. It wasn't even in Jerusalem at the time. And he just wanted to say, I want to be with the Lord. I want to be, I want to be in a relationship with God. That's the thing that I want. So I want to behold the beauty of the Lord, the word zot, to contemplate and think about. I want to th contemplate and think about his beauty, his beauty. No arm, his pleasantness. You see, we get we think about his beauty and we think, oh, he's a good-looking guy. No, no, no. This means his pleasantness, his beauty. I want to think about him that way. See, that's where our hearts need to be, contemplating what God has done that has made our lives pleasant. You know, he didn't have to give flowers a nice smell. He didn't have to let the breeze tickle your, give you the sensation of feeling to feel the nice warm breeze tickle your skin. The beautiful colors of the seasons, he didn't need to, he did. His beauty, his pleasantness, his pleasantness. And we got to be contemplating that. He just, this is what he wanted to do. He wanted to think about that. That's where he said, this is where I want to be. This is what I want. You see, David sought this very deep, ongoing, and intimate relationship. He wanted to behold the he wanted to behold this firsthand. It wasn't a series of perfunctory scheduled meetings. Oh boy, okay, it's Sunday morning. Gee, I know to need to go to church today. Oh well, it's a meal, so I guess we'll have to pray something. Uh, what do we pray? Uh, what do you pray? Um, no, it's not a series of perfunctory. It, this is a relationship. And David's fear is, is, was eliminated because his confidence was rooted on his relationship. So then we get uh, verse 4 and 5. For in the time of trouble, in the time of trouble, in the time of trouble, 
he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle, he shall hide thee. He shall set me upon a rock. Ooh, interesting, interesting, interesting. He's going to lift up my head above my enemies around me. I'll be able to offer in the tabernacle sacrifices of joy, sing, and sing praises to the Lord. Is it a remez? Is it a hint of something deeper? I really think it is. And the words are, are peculiar. Literally, David, in his in his statement here of a desire for close personal relationship meant that God became his sanctuary during times of trouble. You see, even in the worst trouble that you could possibly be in, you fellowshipping with the Lord in private worship and private fellowship gives you a place of sanctuary. So that's a literal translation. It applies to the then, it applies to the now, and it's going to apply to the future. But of course, I can't leave it alone. There's some interesting things here, and I think there's two phrases that tell me it's something deeper. First phrase is, in the time of trouble. Well, that's a code phrase, meaning Daniel's 70th week. It's used both in the Old Testament and New Testament. The times of trouble, um, the times of, of uh, Jacob's trouble, uh, you know, the, the, the tribulation, which means trouble, uh, the, this 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 word is is used, and when I see this, the tri- time of trouble, it's more than just a set of phrases that that, that that David decided to write here. I think it's divinely inspired. It points us to something deeper. The second one is his pavilion. He'll hide thee in his pavilion, not mine. In the secret of his tabernacle, shall he hide me? The, the original tabernacle is in heaven. You know, when when Charlton Heston came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, he also came down with blueprints for the tabernacle. And so, the, 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 but it was a copy after the one in heaven. You see, I believe this is a reference to the rapture when the godly dead and alive are going to arise to meet Jesus in the air and go with him to heaven. Check this out. Here's a couple of Old Testament hints. Isaiah 26, 19 says, your dead shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise. This is talking about the the rapture or the resurrection. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Boy, that sounds so New Testamently like 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Now look at this. Take refuge from the coming judgment. Come, my people, enter your chambers, the ones I prepared for you. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus Christ said that. And shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation, the trouble, is past. For, behold, the Lord comes out of his place. Where's his place? Heaven. He comes out of it. How can he come out of it unless he's going back there? There's where he is. The Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. That's called Daniel's 70th week. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. So we see that incredibly clearly in that passage. It's right there. It's a hint of the rapture. Second one I see is in Zephaniah. I'm sure it was a book you were in last week, right? Zephaniah, it's one of those books we hardly ever visit, but check this out, verse 18. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them when? In the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be, the whole of the earth shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of them that dwell in the land. <laughs> Beginning uh, verse 1 of chapter 2, gather yourselves together. Yes, gather together, O undesirable nation, the nation nobody wants. Before the decree is issued or the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes, before you seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. You see, even then, those who are are Dealing with oppression are told to seek the Lord, seek righteousness, seek humility. Get this. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Huh. We'll disappear from sight from planet Earth. We will be and then be no more on Earth. Hmm. Pretty provocative. Let's continue. Verse 7. 
David writes, hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidst, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face from me, put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help, leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. What's he asking for? And a reminder, what does seeking my face suggest? Well, David wanted confirmation, just like you and me, that our prayers have been heard. You know, we pray and then we say, well, did God hear that? Yes, he did. His hearing is good. He doesn't need any kind of hearing aids. His hearing is perfect. He hears everything. In fact, Scripture tells us that he hears your prayer before you start to utter it because he already knows what's on your heart. So David wanted confirmation just like we do. You know, he's not perfect. He's a man that walks in integrity, and he recognizes that he just he wants a little bit more reassurance here. Now, he's confident that God heard him because in verse 8, God told him to do something. When thou saidst, God, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, will I seek. Look at this. Seek my face. It means to search out intensively in worship or in prayer his presence or face or countenance. This is an intensive, intensive process of seeking the Lord's face. And we do that in prayer and worship. One day, we will see him face to face. But for now, we do this in worship and prayer. Seek my face. Because he said, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, thy face will I seek. You see, God wanted a close, personal, and intimate relationship with David. That's the relationship that he wants with you, too. He wants that close, personal, intimate relationship. Notice that it was David's heart that answered God. I think that is a really interesting statement. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, not his mouth, his heart. Oh, the seat of his innermost being, where his real thoughts and intentions come from, not the words, his heart. You see, what comes out of our heart is what's in our heart. And for David, one who was aware of his integrity, that is, seeing himself like God saw him, not being a hypocrite, recognizing his limitations, knowing that strength was not his, he had to walk by faith, not sight, his heart could say to God, yes, Lord, your face will I seek. Wow. David again claims God to be the author and fulfiller of his salvation here, that which is necessary, by the way, in order to be in God's presence. See, David, a sinful person, can't be in God's presence, but if God is the God of his salvation, therefore he trusted that God was providing that salvation, then he can enjoy that close personal relationship. You see, this is one of the reasons why the greatest decision, the most momentous decision that any human being will make is where they choose to spend eternity. If they accept the gift of grace by Jesus Christ's substitutionary death on the cross for them to be saved, then they take the righteousness that Jesus Christ had, they appropriate that for themselves, and they place on Jesus Christ their sinful nature. Now freed from the, the judgment and consequences of their sin, they can have that close personal relationship with Jesus Christ that is now available to them. You see, 1 John 1, 9 tells us this, if we confess our sins, if, if, if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's not just the stuff we confess. Doesn't mean that if we know it, that we shouldn't confess it and he'll take care of it. It means that everything we can think of if we miss anything, he's going to take care of anything that we miss. You see, this is a precious promise. It's a precious, precious promise. 
God operated the same way in the Old Testament. It's on the finished work of, of Christ, which was yet future to David. Remember that David, in his times with the Lord on the starry hills out in the fields when he was taking care of his sheep, you see, these are the things that came out of his heart that were built and acquired through knowledge and understanding and contemplation and prayer and communication. And so he understood, just like generations beforehand understood, that God said that he, he's going to have a plan of redemption that's going to come through the finished work of his son. Didn't know how that would work. Look, I don't know how many things work, but it doesn't mean I don't believe in them. You know, you, you tell me there's wind. I can't see it, but I can sure see what it does to the leaves. It's on the finished work of Jesus Christ that he could be in God's presence. And so we see in Hebrews 13, 5, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or for, nor forsake you. So we may boldly say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? There's that thing on fear again. You see, it's not just an Old Testament, not fear. It's the New Testament. It's the relationship with God. We should not be fearful people. Then he says something really interesting in verse 10. When my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Who? That's a really interesting one. When my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. What does that mean? Well, the word when is the word key. And it means if, sure, or when. It's a point of condition, not a point of time. You see, you, we say when tomorrow comes, that's a point of time. This is a point of condition. When this occurs or if this occurs. And so the word could have been easily translated by the translator for if my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. It's condition. It's a point of condition. If the Lord so. This is the most unlikely set of conditions in, in Jewish life because Jewish parents would never forsake their children. I mean, we even see evidence of that today. The children and the relationship between children and parents are quite intense, and that's what's taught from early, early years. The parents were the first teachers of the children. This is, this, you know, you did everything for your, your children. You continued to teach them. The whole book of Proverbs is about teaching the children. And so this, this parents would never forsake their children. It's an if-then statement. Another word, and then this take me up, ya aspeni, means to gather, pull together, or receive in the sense of protecting and assuming responsibility for. In other words, in the unlikely event that my parents forsake me, the Lord will be my surrogate parent. If my parents die prematurely, the Lord's my surrogate parent. You see, David is asking for the best possible parent he could ever have, his heavenly father. In verse 11, he then says, teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. Well, what are you specifically requesting here? As a surrogate father and as his surrogate father, David's asking God to teach him and lead him. Because this is what Jewish parents did in terms of educating the children at the young age. He's now, at whatever age he wrote this, is saying, Lord, I need you to lead me and I need you to teach me. Continue to teach me. Teach me your way. Teach me your way. This is a lifelong learning challenge for each one of us. We're never going to arrive at the place where we know it all. Never, ever, not possible. You see, this is a humble heart. Even David, as a young adult, recognizes he doesn't know it all. You know, we look at 18 and 20-year-olds today, and they think they know everything, right? You know, we think about our parents. Our parents were the smartest people we ever met when we were five and six. And by the time we became a teenager, they got dumb. They got stupid. And then we became a 20 or 30 some year old. And all of a sudden, like, have you noticed how bright mom and dad suddenly got? They kind of know some stuff. You see, this humble heart that David had, he never went through that process of being that rebellious teen thinking that he knew everything. Not a fool. 
David's enemies were fierce and relentless. And so David is very transparent when he says, because of my enemies, he's very transparent about his own limitations. He's like, I'm one guy with you. I'm a majority, but I'm one guy. And he has to be asking himself constantly, which of the people around me can I trust? What can my, where can my enemies be hiding? Because that was his experience. No wonder he could have feared, but he didn't. He could have feared. He had every reason to fear. See, fear tends to paralyze one's thinking. And whenever you're in a fearful state, your reasoning and your, 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 your thoughts are unclear. And so he's saying, Father, teach me your way. Lead me in a, in a plain path because my enemies are out there. If I start fearing that, I'm going to get confused and I just need to keep it real simple. Let me just trust you. David's asking God to make the, the, the path clear so he doesn't stumble or walk in trouble. This is a preventative act. Have you prayed for the Lord to make your path clear and straight to you today so that you don't stumble? You need to be like David. We live in an age of deceit where we need to continually ask for God to give us wisdom to see and act clearly because we're in an age of terrible deceit. That's what this age is characterized by, the age of deceit. And so then he lands the plane here. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies. My enemies want to do something with me. Don't let them do it. For false witnesses are risen up against me, people that lie and testify, and then they're lying as such as breathe out cruelly. I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In other words, I, I would have just died of fright. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So here's how he treats the fear of his enemies and the conclusion on how to deal with it. And it absolutely applies to us today. He places the entire things the entire situation into God's hands. He says, I trust you, Lord. I don't trust myself. Had it been up to me, I would have fainted for fear or fright of going it alone. You see, I, I knew I wasn't alone. I don't trust myself and I don't want to be alone, but I know you're with me because you promised me that. And had I been alone, I, I, would, have, I would have freaked out. I, I would have been too frightened. You strengthen me, Father. Because with you, I can. Without you, I fail. With you, I can. Without you, I fail. It's very simple. This is how David lived his life. With you, I can. Without you, I fail. You see, David's instructions to us are wait on the Lord. Recognize that you and the Lord always equal a win. Always a majority. You can, but only if you courageously wait on him. And then the list is strength. Because many, many times you're ready to go, but it's not his timing. It's not the right timing. And then you begin to fear because he it's not it's not clear we don't get to have instant anything folks there's no such thing as instant anything there's no such thing as instant coffee you know somebody cultivated the hill somebody planted the seeds somebody grew grew the bush watered it pruned it fed it somebody went out and harvested the beans somebody went out and processed the beans somebody packaged the beans so you think you had instant coffee this morning you didn't have there's no such thing as instant coffee we have to wait we have to wait we have to wait on the lord for his timing see acting without waiting tells god that we don't trust him you realize that when we act without waiting he said we we're telling god we don't trust you being resigned to fate. Oh, well, you know, I guess if it's going to happen to me, it's going to happen to me. Well, that means we don't trust him because we, doesn't, we don't think he's big enough to prevail. What do we think about God? This is all about what do we think about God? It's all about those opening, opening verses, both of these Psalms on who do we trust? Who do we believe? You see, waiting on him is a faith choice. Despite the noise and confusion of this age of deceit, we need to believe and then we get a chance to see. We need to believe, then we get a chance to see. It's a faith choice on our part. We're to wait courageously. Trust him in the entire matter. Just not, you know, because reality is it's never as bad as we think, right? It's never as bad as we think. Or again, the whole unreasonable fear, the phobias that grip us and cause us to be paralyzed, it's part of sin. You see, only after we wait courageously He's going to strengthen our hearts because he always aligns our hearts with his will. He always will align our hearts, but we need to act. You see, God has already acted. He's waiting for us to get our act together so that we trust him.
That's where this relationship is. Only after this, once we get our hearts aligned in a situation, that we're able to actually enjoy the waiting because we can marvel at what he does, how he works things out. There's nothing more incredible. And this is perhaps one of the reasons why we should journal the victories that God has given us so that we can look back at them and remember that he has never once failed to keep his word, never ever has, never is failing to keep his word now, never ever will be. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for these important words about fear and doubt and keeping our life into proper perspective, having you at the center of it to live a life in round, in proper round. And Father, as we think about where fear comes from, we recognize that not any of it comes from you, but the fact that we would allow wrong belief means that we're not spending enough time with you getting right belief. And then having that process of beginning to think about it and, and, and doubt it and then worry about it and then fear and become terrified, that's all part of sin nature, Father. We gave that up when we accepted your son having died for us on the cross. We, we no longer need to live in fear. We no longer have fear unless we want fear. Father, we confess that any fear that we have right now is, is elected intentionally on our part because we don't trust you. Father, help us point that out in our lives, point out every single place where we don't trust you. Help our hearts to become full of trust and confidence in you so that we can evidence a victorious life to a world around us that is so confused in this age of deceit, walking around terrified by everything, we of all people, Father, should be light to those folks. We should be the ones through whom you work on this planet to give the truth about what's really going on. Father, help us to live up to the standards. You've brought us to this day and age for a reason and given us the work to do, the ministry in this age of deceit for a reason. Help us to live worthy of that calling, Father. These things we ask in the precious and powerful name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.